A few years ago, I read about a single mother facing homelessness whose childcare arrangement failed her the morning of a final job interview. Out of options, she made the tragic choice to leave her young children in a hot car while she attempted to secure the job in order to better the life of her family. She returned to the parking lot following the interview to find her vehicle surrounded by the police. Her children had been hospitalized and she was jailed and charged with felony child abuse. As I have traveled around the country with my father, stories about the hardships caused by our existing childcare system, one that is too expensive, too outdated, and too inaccessible, come up time and time again. Just last week, I spoke with a military spouse who recounted the vicious cycle responsible for holding so many of American families back economically. She relayed to me the frustration I've heard all too often of not being able to work and bring home a second income because she can't afford quality and reliable childcare. Stories like these go straight to my heart and they've steeled my belief that there has to be a better way. I have three young children myself and I'm grateful daily for the means to pursue two of my dreams, being a mother and investing in a career that fulfills me. I recognize that far too few women can say the same for themselves and that I am more fortunate than most. This must change. As a society, we need to create policies that champion all parents, enabling the American family to thrive. My dad agrees, and he's in a very unique position to do something about this problem and the numerous other problems facing tens of millions of parents and caregivers across our country. Today, Childcare is the single greatest expense for many American families, even exceeding the cost of housing in much of the country. It's depleting the hard-earned savings of men and women across our nation, and it's at the root of wage inequality by disproportionately affecting women. The federal policies that are in place to benefit families were written more than 65 years ago to serve a primarily male workforce that no longer exists. Dual income families were not the norm in 1949 when the current tax code provisions regarding families were established. Today, however, women represent 47% of the US labor force, and in almost two thirds of married couples, both spouses work outside of the home. 70% of mothers with children at home also work in a professional capacity, and 64% of these moms have kids aged six and under. The number of households led by single mothers has doubled in the last 30 years, and approximately two-thirds of these women work in low-wage jobs that offer neither flexibility nor benefits. My father has created a plan that is designed to bring relief and to provide working parents with options so that they can make the decisions that are in the best interest of their families. Safe, Affordable, high quality childcare should not be the luxury of a fortunate few. Historically, this has not been an area that has received nearly as much attention in the policy world as it deserves. While there are systems in place for older children, hardly any intellectual energy has been devoted to addressing the needs of families with children from birth to four years old. In particular, Little focus has been put on determining how best to alleviate the enormous financial burdens childcare places on low-income and middle-income families. At the same time, the United States is the only industrialized nation in the world that does not provide new mothers with paid maternity leave. My father's policy will give paid leave to mothers whose employers are among the almost 90% of U.S. businesses that currently do not offer this benefit. This is a reform that is of critical value and long overdue. My father's plan also recognizes and supports the many women who may not be mothers, but who are, have left paying jobs to provide care for elderly dependents. This is another example of people who have been routinely ignored by federal policies. Having employed and empowered thousands of women at every level of his company, Throughout his entire career, my father understands the needs of the modern workforce 
and is offering a new and innovative solution where others have not. My father's plan also acknowledges the vital contribution of stay-at-home moms and parents, fathers and mothers, who will ensure that they too will receive these new tax benefits. Raising children full-time is one of the hardest jobs anyone can do, and it's essential that our policies recognize and honor that reality. As an employer, a mother, and a woman who works, both inside and outside the home, these are topics I consider of critical importance. The policy my father is about to outline is one that I am proud to have helped conceptualize and ensuring its enactment will be one of my top priorities when he is elected come November. <laughs> this is not a woman's issue. It's a family issue. It's an American issue. It's an issue that's often been discussed, but has yet to be solved. My father plans to change that. And now, he will tell you how. It is with great admiration and respect that I introduce to you our next president and my father, Donald J. Trump. Thank you very much, and I want to applaud my daughter, Ivanka, for her work and leadership on this issue. She has been working very, so very hard. Ivanka has been deeply invested in this since long before the campaign began, I can tell you that. And I'm very grateful to her for her work, her efforts, and this proposal, which we're going to be outlining right away. I think it's going to make a lot of people very, very happy, a lot of moms very happy. I want to also take a moment to recognize Congresswoman Kathy McMorris Rogers, the chairwoman of the House Republican Conference, and a mother of three small children, who's been such a leader and worked so hard with us. So, uh, Kathy, we want to thank you very much. Also, we're joined tonight by some amazing members of Congress in our audience, Congresswoman Blackburn, Lomas, Black, Archler, and Elmers. Come on up here. Just come on. Up. Come on. They work so hard on this. Come on up. Marsha Blackburn, and I'm from the great state of Tennessee. And I want to say thank you to all of you for the warm reception that you have given to us. And I want to say a special thank you to Mr. Trump. Focusing on the issues that affect working women is something that is vitally important to each of us standing on this stage. We come from a variety of backgrounds. We have a nurse, we have farmers, we have ranchers, we have teachers, we have small business owners and entrepreneurs. That's the skill set that we bring to Congress and the experience that we draw from. And we know that each of you are much like us. Those are the experiences that you have. We know that there are issues when it comes to childcare, when it comes to dealing with the workplace, and just as Ivanka said so perfectly, this is a family issue. We know men always want more money. What do women want? More time. And, and we are thrilled to finally have 
a president of the United States who is going to put the focus on working with women to make certain that you can achieve your American dream. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you very much. And Mayor Giuliani, please stand up. Rudy Giuliani. The nation's mayor. Oh, he's done a good job. So our campaign is about ideas. We're about solutions to big, big problems. Problems that have gone on forever. I've traveled all over the country in recent weeks offering detailed plans to make life better for you and for your family, so important to me. I've outlined detailed proposals for providing school choice, we have to do that, reforming our tax and regulatory code. <laughs> lifting restrictions on American energy, rebuilding our military, changing our foreign policy, fixing our immigration, so important, and keeping our country safe. Right now, <laughs> thank you. Right now, our politicians have locked our country into endless fights about small and petty things. I'm asking the nation to lift our sights and to imagine what we can accomplish if we work together, trust each other, and put the needs of our citizens first for a change. We must break our ties with the failed and bitter politics and policies of the past and pursue a future where every American is honored, and I mean really honored and respected. We have to reject the arrogance of Washington, D.C. that looks down on everyday hardworking people, and that's what's happening. Too often, those who have power have disdain for the views, beliefs, and attitudes of those who don't have any political power. Those in leadership must put themselves in the shoes of the laid-off factory worker, the family worried about security, or the mom struggling to afford child care. Child care is such a big problem. And we're going to solve that problem. That means we need working mothers to be fairly compensated for their work and have access to affordable, quality child care for their kids. That's what we're doing. We want higher pay, better wages, and a growing economy for everyone. These solutions must update laws passed more than a half a century ago when most women were still not in the labor force. Most of them weren't even close. Today, nearly two and three mothers with young children have jobs. For many families in our country, childcare is now the single largest expense. Who so would think that? Even more so than housing. Yet very little meaningful policy work has been done in this area, and my opponent has no childcare plan. She never will, and if it ever evolves into a plan, it'll never get done anyway. All talk, no action. Many Americans are just one crisis away from disaster. A sick kid, a lost job, a damaged home. There is no financial security in our country, especially anymore. But that will change under our pro-family profile. When you just take a look, it's pro-family, it's pro-child, it's pro-worker. These are 